What's up guys, this is Nate with Dirt Lifestyle and today we're gonna build the ultimate TJ slash XJ Dana 30. I know there's a lot of haters out there of the Dana 30 and I totally get it. You know, there's a lot of applications you'll see people use a too small of an axle and you know, they end up breaking and becoming a trail plug or whatever else. But this is not one of those instances. My brother's Jeep is a 2001 TJ. He's never gonna upgrade that motor to a V8 or anything like that. So there's no reason to, you know, put a bigger axle for horsepower. You know, it's just got the stock 4.0 with like 51,000 miles on it or something super low like that. And he's not planning on going bigger than a 35. You know, the biggest I could probably talk him into maybe would be 37s one day, but he's been on 33s for years. He's been very happy with it. But now that it was time to change the tires out, he decided to up one size and go to a 35. And I'm telling you from experience, 35s on a TJ with lockers in Washington can go almost on every trail. I mean, there are only a few trails that I can think of off the top of my head that you would struggle with 35s or you couldn't do with 35s because you know they're too too big of rocks or something like that. But for the most part, for a trail rig, a TJ on 35s is a really good all around performer. I'm doing this video as part of a collaboration with another channel, you might've heard of them, Muddy Beards. So go to Muddy Beards 4x4, subscribe to their channel. They're gonna have part two of this. This is three parts. The first part, we're gonna put a truss on it. We're gonna weld the inner C's, all that stuff. Part two, my buddy Kelly with Muddy Beards is gonna do the gear and locker install. So if you've ever been curious on how to set up Dana 30 ring and pinions yourself, my buddy Kelly's gonna be doing a video on that. And then we're gonna end the series back on this channel. It's gonna be episode three, and we're going to get some junkyard parts. We're gonna do a full Frankenstein build with some steering upgrades some brake upgrades, and some axle shaft upgrades. First thing I wanna take care of here is gonna be assembling the truss. So I wanna stick the truss on there, I'm gonna tack it together in a way that looks straight for both sides, because we need to line up everything from the inside out, just kinda of set it on the tubes in order to tack and weld the inner sea gussets. As you can see, we have a table full of puzzle pieces and I've already started putting this upper truss portion together. I'm gonna kind of put this together loose. I'm gonna pick it up, set it on there, and then kind of line it up and make sure that uh, everything's straight, give it a couple tacks so it'll sit on there without me holding it. The reason I wanted to build the truss first is so I could have this hold steady while I stack this stuff together. So the first thing I really want to weld to the axle is going to be these sea gussets and I don't want to weld these in a position that's going to make it where I can't fit all this stuff back together. Like if you just put it down here not thinking that it needs to go all the way up here, you might shoot yourself in the foot and make it where it all doesn't fit. But since we started here first, we know we're good to go. Next thing I want to get tacked in are these lower sea gussets. Before we weld on our sea gussets, I want to bolt this knuckle into place. And the reason being, I don't want while we're welding this, uh, this relationship to change at all. So I feel a little bit more comfortable heating this up and welding it while I have these bad boys bolted on. I'm not concerned about torching these because we're gonna be pulling these out anyway and replacing them with brand new ones. My oxyacetylene setup is pretty much always empty, so we are going to use these three map gas torches to heat up the cast on this before we weld it. There's a couple different ways you can do this. The right way is to get some like nickel rod or some nickel welding wire um, because it makes it to where it's a little bit easier to weld the cast without having any issues with it uh, forming any cracks. But if you heat it up enough, then you can still get a pretty good weld in it and uh, not have to worry about any cracks. We're gonna use a laser thermometer to periodically check what the temperature of the steel is throughout this process. Well, strategy's changing a little bit. As soon as I uh, went to turn the axle, oh geez, woo, that's hot. As soon as I went to turn the axle, the ball joint actually melted, which I knew was gonna get hot, but I didn't think it was gonna melt. Anyway, something to maybe take note of whenever you do this. <laughs> As you can see, it's a little hot. <laughs> Definitely got it hot enough. Everything looks like it penetrated just fine. 
Um, now we just need to watch it as it cools. If we see any cracks, we know that it cooled too fast. Um, I'm gonna monitor the temperature. You can cool it with a torch actually, if you're really careful with the way you do it. Um, just make sure that it doesn't come crashing down too quickly. Definitely looks beefier. I like that much better. Just in case I wasn't clear enough for people who are new to fabrication, um, the reason that we're heating this cast is because the cast and the steel, they heat and they cool at different rates and shocking it into a really high temperature, it makes it really hard on the cast and it makes it easy to get a crack in your weld. So the reason that we're preheating these is to make it to where it's not as much of a shock on the cast and we wanna make sure that the cast and the steel both get to a really high temperature and then cool down at about the same rate. The next thing I wanna do is locate this lower coil bracket. Before we get it onto the axle, we have to weld this tab right here and this is gonna dictate how wide your shock is. So I have a sleeve that I use for this kind of thing that's pretty universal in size. It's a little bit wider than what my shocks are and a little bit wider than what my brother's shocks are, but that's a good thing. It's going to ensure that after this is all said and done, the shock will still fit in between this space once it's all welded up. Now we gotta weld these weird little guys. So it goes together like this, and then it fits where the coil goes. Now if um, you wanna get crazy, you can take the coil, you can put it in here, make sure it's centered. But I know that if we just kinda eyeball it from the top, we can make sure that everything fits just right. One more thing that needs to be tacked up before we mount this lower coil bracket is gonna be the lower mount for the track bar. My brother didn't bring his track bar, no big deal. We pulled the one off my Jeep and we just found a random bolt and now we're just gonna tack it up so we can remove this without melting the bushing. Locating the lower coil bucket is pretty simple when you read the instructions. It basically states that you need a nine and a half degree difference between the flat part of your truss and the flat part of the lower coil bracket. It might be hard to see in the camera, but right now we're at about 10 degrees. So what we want is zero, at least close to zero. And we're just about where we need to be right now. So I'm gonna tack this into place and this is still loose up here. What I wanna do is tack this into place and then we're gonna pull this off so I have access to the inside of the weld under here and then we can tack the truss on as well. Now we can tack the truss in a couple spots. Locating the driver's side lower coil bracket is easy. We basically just need to make sure that it's the exact same angle as our passenger side. Now we're gonna tack in the driver's side truss. Starting to look like something now. Everything's getting tacked in pretty much. We only have a few things left to finish. This is the last thing that floats around and I'm gonna tack it where I think it belongs. I'm gonna grab a coil off of my Jeep over there and then just make sure that it fits, then I'll burn it in. The only thing that's gonna be left after that is just a couple of different tabs that just kind of fit, that's tab and slots, very straightforward, very simple, and um, it's just plug and play. It's one of my favorite things about these kits. Holy cow, that's a lot of work. Let's see how we did. I went a little out of the order from what the instructions say to do, but it was just based on my best judgment. So it all went together okay. We had no issues really, other than the uh, exploding ball joints and whatnot, but everything else has been really, really good. The only two brackets we have left are gonna be the lower control arm brackets, and we're gonna do those right now. These are pretty straightforward. See DS, that is driver's side. And according to the instructions, we want the inside of this about a sixteenth of an inch away from the outside of that and then we want to tilt it up to where the distance between here and here is also a sixteenth of an inch 
Very easy. Same story on the passenger side. It says PS, and you locate it about a sixteenth of an inch away from the shock tab bracket. This axle looks so much better with a truss on it. It's much beefier, not worried about bending it, that's for sure, or tearing off a bracket or any of the other issues that you have with an XJ or a TJ axle stock. If you learned something in this video and you wanna see more stuff like it, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. If you want to support us by buying shirts and hats, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We'll see you next time. <laughs>